Let's start with the red cell itself. And here is that very familiar electron micrograph of red cells showing their biconcave shape. Red cells derive from erythroblasts in the bone marrow. They're packed with hemoglobin and they carry oxygen deep into tissues. The production of these cells is regulated by erythropoietin. And they don't have a nucleus, so their lifespan is limited and is around 120 days. Anemia is very common throughout the world. It can be defined as a reduction in the hemoglobin level within the blood. But remember that this must be taken in relation to two factors. One is the age of the patient and the other is the gender. Let's just look at that table on the right, which shows typical hemoglobin concentrations at different ages. If we look at the mean hemoglobin column, at birth, cord blood has a high hemoglobin concentration, around 165 grams per litre. But then the green line at one month shows that this has already fallen to 140 grams per litre. In the first few weeks of life, there is a lot of breakdown of red cells within the blood and change of the globin to a different form. At six months to two years, you see a relatively low hemoglobin concentration, 120 grams per litre, which then starts to increase at the age of 12 to 18 to around 140. And then look at adults right at the bottom and you'll see the characteristic difference between females and males in the hemoglobin concentration, with males having that increment of around 15 grams per litre, due to the effect of anabolic male hormones. Now, the symptoms of anemia include a range of things, including tiredness, shortness of breath, poor concentration, palpitations, because the heart is beating fast and vigorously. And of course, pallor is a sign that somebody may be anemic. A good method for approaching the classification of anemia is through analysis of the red cell volume. So let's now take a look at that in a little more detail. Here we see the classification of anemia based on the mean cell volume. So on the blue row, you will see the anemia type, microcytic hypochromic. Those are small cells with low levels of hemoglobin. Here we have two subsets of disease that we will discuss in more detail, iron deficiency and thalassemia. In the middle, we have normal sized cells, normocytic and normochromic. These are due to chronic infection, renal disease, and marrow disease, and may also include hemolytic anemia. Whereas on the right, we have macrocytic anemia, large red cells with a raised MCV. And we'll see later on how these are normally secondary to vitamin deficiencies, particularly vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. Let's take the first of these, and that is iron deficiency. First, we have to consider the physiology of iron within your body. Now, iron is one of the most common elements in the crust of the earth. And yet we only have around four or five grams of iron within our body. There's also no mechanism for regulating the excretion of iron. And so we have to be very careful how much iron we absorb. We now think that this is the case because iron can be quite toxic in excess and it can even lead to damage of DNA. And so the absorption of iron is controlled to levels that we just need to maintain normal physiological function. On the right, the diagram shows where this iron is held within the body. And you will see that 70% is incorporated into hemoglobin with 25% stored in the reticuloendothelial system. Minor fractions are circulating within the blood. This is a representation of iron regulation. 
and we can see at the top our intake of iron is around 10 to 20 milligrams per day in our food. There are two major forms of iron that we encounter in our diet. Heme iron comes in meat products, and that's relatively well absorbed. Whereas non-heme iron is more tricky for our body to absorb. In the stomach, much of this iron is reduced into the ferrous Fe2 plus form, and that helps absorption. And you'll see that absorption occurs in the upper small intestine. But on the left-hand side of the slide, you will see that much of this is absorbed into mucosal cells and then shed for excretion, perhaps a milligram a day. Whereas around a milligram goes into the bloodstream and there is absorbed and is used in erythropoiesis. So what's this iron used for? It's used largely for making hemoglobin. Let's just look at how our cells make hemoglobin. And you'll see that that is a representation of a mitochondrion on the left. And at the top of the mitochondrion, you'll see glycine and succinyl-CoA. And those are the first derivatives that come together to form the constituents of the heme. The delta ALA enzyme, aminolevulenic acid, is a rate-limiting step here, and it produces, through intermediates, protoporphyrin, this very interesting flat planar molecule. And you'll see that that comes out of the mitochondria, links with iron, and forms heme. Now, of course, heme needs globin, and globin, you see, comes from the top right as amino acids forming these chains of 141 or 146 amino acids long. As we bring heme and globin together, we form the hemoglobin, which is so densely concentrated within red cells. When we look later at hemolytic anemias, we'll take this process in reverse and see how hemoglobin is degraded and how that can lead to some of the symptoms of hemolytic anemia. Now, iron deficiency is one of the most common findings in people around the globe. And the major cause is chronic blood loss, particularly through menstruation. Women who are premenopausal, having regular menstruation, are very commonly iron deficient. It can also be the result of gastrointestinal malignancy or inflammation. And that's very important because if you see a man who has iron deficiency anemia, clearly there can't be menstruation. That is a warning sign, also in a postmenopausal woman. You must think if there is a gastrointestinal cause, perhaps a colonic tumor or even a gastric tumor. And those should be investigated in many cases, most cases. Dietary deficiency of iron is actually quite uncommon. And malabsorption can occur, and of course celiac disease is an important consideration there, but they're relatively less common than actually chronic blood loss. The treatment of iron deficiency is usually relatively easy, and it's with oral iron, iron salts, which have been around for over 100 years. They're one of the cheapest tablets you can possibly buy. Now, some people can't tolerate oral iron. It can lead to some gastrointestinal upset. And so intravenous iron can also be given and is really very well tolerated now. Now, on the right, there is a blood film of a person with iron deficiency. And you can see how those cells fit those two criteria that we described. Microcytic, they're small. Hypochromic. They're poorly hemoglobinized. You see very pale staining cells. Another feature is pencil cells, very long, thin cells, as you can see in one or two places.